All righty, folks. I think we'll get started here. It is now six o'clock. So we are starting New Testament survey. Welcome to New Testament survey. Uh, many of you were here for the Old Testament survey last year, but we got a number of new faces as well. So uh, we'll kind of give you a, a rundown of what we usually do, um, which is not going to technically be today. Today's going to be a little different, but um, always on the back table, we have notes. If you didn't pick up those notes yet, uh, you may want to head over there and grab some. We've got three things to get today. One handout, one syllabus, and one uh, poster. Of the whole New Testament. Did you call the second one? Syllabus. So there will be a quiz each time we come to class and a test at the end of the month. No, I'm kidding. There'll be there's no quizzes or anything like that. And actually, don't tell the new people. <laughs> we'll scare them a little bit. But uh, we uh, we are actually not going to have the same homework that we did last time as well, because. I want everybody to read along with the reading plan that we're doing as a whole church. Maybe you've done that. Maybe you haven't. If you haven't taken a look at that, um, I'd encourage you to do so. We're going through the Robert Murray McShane plan. Um, and so we're in four different places every day. And you can go to TGC. I'm not. So, But, but if you look at the, the syllabus, you'll see I have a suggestion on there because you can read the whole New Testament in about... 18 hours out loud. So, really not terribly bad, right? Um, almost one hour a week would get you there. Uh, but if you if you track along with the readings that we're doing as a church, you're pretty much going to do that anyway. Um, and so, really, there's not going to be... Uh, we're, and almost on schedule. It's almost going to follow our schedule, uh, if you look closely at that. Um, so, I'm not going to try to add anything extra to your, your reading there. Um, I may try to if I can, on purpose, mention some things that come up as, as we go. Um, but other than that, um, we're going to have a couple weeks of intro here, one kind of intro to the whole uh, New Testament, and we're going to specifically look today at how did we get the Bible, um, so that, that some of the history there, some of the issues there. Um, and then next time, we're going to look more closely at the Gospels. Uh, why do we have four Gospels? What's unique about each one of them? And then the next week, we're going to start with Matthew and um We'll just make our way through Matthew to Revelation. I'm not changing up the order on you this time like I did with the Old Testament. <laughs> I think the, the order is okay. Um, but yeah, so uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing we're going to go through is going to be a series of eight questions. We'll see that with your notes. I've got to make sure I'm on the right page here. So these are the eight questions we're going to take a look at. Maybe we'll get to them all today. Maybe we won't. Uh, but what is the Bible? Do we have the right books? Has the Bible been corrupted? Can we trust our translations? Is the Bible full of contradictions? Do the Gospels disagree? What is the synoptic problem? And why did they wait to write it down? So a lot of these uh, came from the questions that we did in our summer series with the youth. Uh, we did kind of an apologetic series with them over the summer. And uh, a lot of these questions came up, and even some of these questions, including the one about the synoptic problem, were sent in by the students. Um, so really impressive stuff from them, uh, and some, some really awesome questions. So hopefully you can compete with that, uh, uh, with their levels of curiosity. Um, but first of all, what is the Bible? What do we mean when we talk about the Bible? Well, the basic idea, and why we call this class New Testament, uh, is because we have an Old Testament and a New Testament. Testament is uh, a Latin word, and uh, it's really a translation of the word covenant. And so you remember we talk about covenant a whole lot in the Old Testament. If you read your Bible, you're going to see covenants all throughout there. Uh, covenants with Noah, uh, with Abraham, uh, which we kind of just you know passed some of these times in our, our readings the, the last couple days. Um, you know Genesis 9, Genesis 12. And on and on and on, it gets repeated, and we have a covenant at Sinai, and some of these other things. Um, but that's the old, the old Testament is the old covenant, kind of all summarized together. It's Genesis through Malachi, 39 books, as you know. Uh, the, the timeline that we have for that is 1450 to around 400 BC. Those aren't hard and fast dates, but it's basically from the Exodus to uh, around 400, maybe 430, 450, depending on who you ask, uh, when Malachi was finally written. 
which is the last book we have. And of course, the Old Testament is written in Hebrew. And there's a little bit of Aramaic uh, there in kind of uh, Daniel and Ezra, uh, or a couple other verses and places, um, but mostly in Hebrew. Uh, and then we get to the New Testament. We're going to have a different language, but what is the New Testament? It's Matthew through Revelation, uh, 27 books, as you know, for a total of 66, correct? Bonus points. Uh, and how, when was it written? Well, we'll talk more as we get to each individual book, but I think uh, basically 45 AD to 90 AD. And you'll notice one thing that's really different, right? We had a, a gap of about a thousand years for the Old Testament from the first book was written to the last book. And in the New Testament, we've got less than 50. It all happens in uh, short order um, because who wrote the New Testament? Those who had firsthand contact with Jesus. Um, or secondhand contact, as we'll see with uh, people like Luke. Um, but anyway, the New Testament is written in Greek. So we have Hebrew in the Old Testament and Greek in the New Testament. Um, but to, to see, give you a little bit uh, of a way, maybe to say it a little better than I can, uh, we're going to start with a video from the Gospel Project. Now, if you were able to watch these along, or if you've ever seen them before, they're really, really well done. Um, and in fact, this is going to go over the poster that you have. Um, so you may kind of follow along as they, as they go through. Um, and they're going to explain, I think in a really, really good way, how to fit the story of the New Testament into the, with the Old Testament. It's one of the things they're, they're really good at. Um, and I hope you'll, you'll see that. And on your syllabus, I've given you links, uh, at least the video titles, um, to each of the videos that corresponds with each of the books. There's one of these posters for each and every book of the New Testament uh, and for the Old Testament. And uh, some of you have nice collections going, and we'll make sure to fill those out so you'll have the whole Bible. But anyway, here's, here's their uh, presentation on the New Testament. The New Testament. If you open up a Bible to a table of contents, you'll see it's made up of two large collections, the Old and New Testament. The word testament refers to a covenant partnership which is what both of these collections are all about. They tell one epic and complicated story of God's covenant partnership with Israel and all of humanity. The Old Testament is called Tanakh in Jewish tradition. It's a unified scroll collection of 39 Israelite texts. I remember why. over a thousand years in the making. In contrast, the 27 books of the New Testament all came into existence within 30 to 40 years of each other. They were all written by first-generation followers of Jesus. From an early period, Christian communities began collecting these texts and reading them alongside the Old Testament as one unified story that leads to Jesus. The New Testament begins with four narrative books that together are called the Gospels. They tell the story of Jesus of Nazareth's life, death, and resurrection as an announcement of good news. They're followed by a fifth narrative work called Acts of the Apostles. Here, the risen Jesus commissions the apostles, a word that means the sent ones. They're appointed as Jesus' representatives to spread the good news about him throughout the ancient world. After Acts comes a collection of letters from the apostles. These were written to provide teaching and guidance for local communities of Jesus' followers called churches. There are 13 letters connected to the Apostle Paul, and they're not arranged in the order of when they were written, but rather from the longest to the shortest. Then there's a letter to the Hebrews, written by a close but unnamed associate of the apostles. After this are the letters of James, Jude, Peter, and John. Two were brothers of Jesus, and two were among his first followers. The last New Testament book is the Revelation, a letter to seven churches that reveals a prophetic word of challenging comfort to all of Jesus' followers. So those are the books of the New Testament, but what are they about? And how do they connect with the Old Testament to make up one unified story? Think of it this way. The Bible is one long epic narrative with multiple movements or acts. The Old Testament recounts the first series of acts that give you everything you need to make sense of the story to follow. The core themes and the plot conflict are arranged in design patterns. And then in the New Testament, these are all picked up and carried forward to the story's culmination in Jesus. Let me show you what I mean. The first act is about God and all humanity. God provides a sweet garden temple for humans who are made to be God's partners in ruling the world. But the humans are foolish, and they give in to a dark temptation and rebel against God's wisdom. So they're exiled into a wilderness where they start killing each other. They build cities that spread their selfishness and oppression, leading up to the big bad city of Babylon. But God loves the world and its foolish humans, so he sets in motion a rescue plan by promising the arrival of a new human who will destroy the evil that has lured us into self-destruction. 
The next act of the biblical story is about God and Israel, and it develops the themes and patterns of the first act. God calls a new humanity out of Babylon into a sweet garden land. Abraham, Sarah, and his descendants, the Israelites. God promises that through them, divine blessing will be restored to all of the nations. Surely these are the new humans that we're waiting for, but the Israelites repeat humanity's rebellion against God, building their own violent cities that lead to self-destruction and another exile in Babylon. But God sustains his promise that the new human will come from Abraham's lineage. It will be a priest king who will now have to rescue both Israel and humanity from Babylon to restore God's blessing to the world. Now, notice how these two acts are designed according to the same pattern. The second act is a longer and more violent version of the first, and together they explore the tragic human condition, but they also highlight God's promise, which is developed more in the next act, the Old Testament prophets and poets. The prophets accused Israel and all nations of their evil, and they announced that one day God himself would arise to bring the day of the Lord and deliver his world from Babylon. He would do it through a promised royal priest who's going to suffer like a slave and die for the sins of Israel and all humanity, but then he'll be exalted as king over the nation. He will call others to leave Babylon and join the new covenant people who will partner with God to rule over a new Jerusalem, that is, over a new creation. And so the Old Testament concludes by anticipating a new act in the story. And when you turn to the New Testament, it's the same story now being carried forward in Jesus. Let's see how. The four gospel accounts introduce Jesus of Nazareth both as the promised son of Abraham who will restore God's blessing to the nations, and also as that new human who will defeat evil and restore humanity to partnership with God. So Jesus is portrayed as a human and more. He went about announcing the arrival of God's promised kingdom, and he spoke and acted as if he was Israel's divine king. But instead of calling himself king, Jesus referred to himself as the son of man, that is, the human one who would act like a servant. The Gospels are making the claim that in Jesus, Israel's God has become the faithful Israelite and the true human that we are all made to be but have failed to be. Jesus' mission was to confront that dark evil that lurks underneath humanity's evil, luring us into selfishness, violence, and death. But how do you defeat that kind of evil? The surprising answer in the Gospels is that Jesus overcame our evil by allowing it to kill him on his paradoxical throne, the cross where Jesus died for humanity's evil and sin. And it's where he lived out what he taught, that nonviolence, forgiveness, and self-giving love are the most powerful things in the universe. And because God's love for his world is stronger than evil or death, Jesus was raised to new life as the prototype of a new humanity. And this brings us to the story of Acts. Through the Spirit, God empowers Jesus' followers to spread the life and love of Jesus out into the world as they invite people to leave their old humanity and join Jesus' multi-ethnic family, the new humanity. This is where the letters from the apostles fit into the story. Here the apostles address early Christian communities, and they show how the good news about the risen king Jesus changed history and should reshape every part of our lives. They also explained the good news by constantly appealing to stories from the Old Testament and the stories of Jesus, showing us how to see our own life stories as part of the epic biblical story. So all humanity is trapped in a Babylonian exile, this is awesome. but Jesus came to create a new home. We're all living in different kinds of Egyptian slavery to selfishness and sin, but Jesus died as the Passover lamb to liberate us into the promised land. Our old humanity is bound for the dust of death, but Jesus' resurrection opened up a new future for a new humanity. We live here in the current evil age, but through Jesus and the Spirit, a new creation has burst open here and now. And this leads us to the book of Revelation, where the whole biblical story comes together in powerful symbolism and imagery. Jesus is portrayed as a slaughtered, bloody lamb, who is exalted as the divine king of the world. He's leading his people out of slavery and exile in Babylon. And as they resist Babylon's influence, they may have to suffer alongside their slain leader. But when you follow the risen king, not even death can prevent the dawn of the new creation, which is here depicted as a new Jerusalem garden temple, the true home of humanity after its long exile. And so on the Bible's last page, heaven and earth are reunited. And the new humans take up their appointed task from the Bible's first page to rule the world together in the love and power of God. The New Testament is a remarkable collection of documents. 
They represent the testimony of the apostles that points us to the risen Jesus himself. And through God's Spirit, these human words have been speaking a divine word of hope from the first century to the 21st. Each book shows how God, through Jesus and the Spirit, is leading our world to its ultimate goal in a renewed creation. And so the story's end is really the beginning of a new story that is yet to be told. And that's what the New Testament is all about. All right. I don't know if you ever heard a, a better summary of the Bible in 10 minutes, <laughs> but that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, and so I think you'll enjoy uh, kind of going through uh, and, and listening to these things, seeing the visuals. They also do other kind of animations and specific themes. Uh, really cool, really clever, really well done. We don't agree with them 100% of the time, but that would be impossible. Um, I don't agree with myself 100% of the time. So, uh, uh, but we'll get to know them uh, if you haven't already. Here's, here's kind of, uh, my, I say my summary. This comes from one of the, the books that I was reading in, in prep for Old Testament. We actually mentioned this in the class, but how do you summarize the Bible in, in one sentence? Well, here goes. God's kingdom through his covenant for his glory in his Christ, his anointed king. And uh, Again, I think that's a, a pretty good job of summarizing all of these themes together. And so this is what the Bible is about. Um, but how do we often approach the New Testament? Right? You'll see sometimes we approach it as the standalone testament. There's even some denominations who believe, no, we're a New Testament church. We don't have anything to do with that Old Testament. And um, so we treat the New Testament as if it stands on its own. And as, as you've seen, that really does mess up a whole lot of the connections that are built into the very new, uh, structure of the New Testament. We also often, sometimes, characterize the New Testament as the one that's sweet. The Old Testament is mean, the New Testament is nice. And um, upon closer inspection, that just doesn't work. Um, so, so how should we approach the New Testament? Well, just a, a couple points I wanted to say here. We, we should approach it as the sequel to the Old Testament story. It's continuing um, one story in another movement, another act. And so we need to Notice the connections between the old story and the story that's told in the new. It's also the fulfillment of the Old Testament hope. So there were all these hopes that were built up and built up for this, especially for this suffering royal priest king. Um, who is this going to be? What is it going to look like? And um, lots of different things were a big part of that. I think next time we're going to talk about some of the history of the in-between years uh, after um, the Old Testament was completed from about 400 until zero BC, basically. Uh, there were a lot of things that happened uh, in this part of the world. And a lot of them affected how the, uh, the people, especially the, the Jewish leaders, responded to a figure like Jesus. And so we'll talk about that next time. Uh, but here's Jesus' own words about how he relates to the Old Testament. Jesus says this in Matthew 5. Do not think I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot, will pass from the law until all is accomplished. So Jesus himself doesn't say he's, he's abolishing the law, doing away with it. He's fulfilling it. And there's a difference. Um, that's still a profound thing to have the law fulfilled. And Christ does that for us. And there's lots of different ways to uh, bring out the meaning of this verse. But that's what Jesus says. He, he's not here to abolish the law. And what else does Jesus say? Well, in, in Luke's gospel, at the very end of the story, as Jesus has already been raised from the dead, there's two men walking down the road to Emmaus, a town outside of Jerusalem, and they uh, hadn't heard the news yet. Or they had, and they didn't quite know what to believe in. So Jesus walks with them, and then they uh, eventually get in. He reveals who he is to them, uh, and he says this to them, O oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then it says, in beginning with Moses and all the prophets, the whole Old Testament, that's a shorthand for that, he interpreted to them in the scriptures the things concerning himself. In all the scriptures. Talk about a Bible study you'd want to be at. Um, Jesus himself explaining how it's all about him. And later on he says this as well. These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me 
in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. As you remember from Old Testament class, that corresponds to our three divisions, the law, the prophets, and the writings. Um, so he opened their mind to understand the scriptures. So again, Jesus himself is saying, all of this is about me. And so that really ought to color how we read the Old Testament, but it also informs us a lot for how we read the New Testament. And I'll just show you a couple of these uh, graphics that some people have put together to show all the different cross-references in the Bible. So this is basically everything above the line is a forward-pointing reference. Everything below the line is a backward-pointing reference. The blue stuff is Old Testament. The red stuff is New Testament. But you can see there's a lot of connections there. You can't separate these two. <laughs> that would just be impossible. And uh, another visualization uh, looks like this, drawing all the connections between Scripture. Um, and of course, that's just when persons counting of those things. There are inevitably more and more connections to see. And as we study the Bible, as we become better readers of the Bible, these are the kind of things we're going we're gonna to see. We're going to see more. But uh, at this moment as well, I want to just take a second to look at kind of some doctrine of Scripture stuff. Uh, what does the Bible say about itself? This is kind of an important foundation for, for everything we're going to talk about and why we're even here studying the Bible. The first thing is that the Bible is inspired. That means it's breathed out by God. God is the source of Scripture, not humankind, not just what men dreamed up of their own opinions. Uh, that's what Second Peter tells us. The Bible is also true, and that means, therefore, without error. Uh, sometimes we use the word inerrant to describe this about the Bible. Well, if the Bible's from God and God cannot lie, well, then the Bible's going to be true in everything that it says. And so that's important for us to believe, um, despite the challenges that people will make. To the Bible. Uh, and secondly, or thirdly, I should say, the Bible is authoritative. That means you have to listen to it. It demands a response from you. It's not just something you can kind of uh, have in your head. It, it's telling you what you ought to do. Uh, and But fourthly, the Bible is clear. We can understand it. Uh, I'm trying to remember what the, the $4 theological word is, but I think that the perspicuity of Scripture or something like that, Scripture can be understand by, understood by us. It's some people who have the scriptures, other religions, might not necessarily believe that their scriptures are clear. It's kind of a mystery. But we believe, no, God meant to communicate to us. God revealed himself, and he did it in such a way that we can understand it. And so that ties into this next one. The Bible is sufficient. It tells us everything we need to know. Does the Bible tell us everything that you could possibly ever know? No, it doesn't. But it tells us everything we need in order to live a life that's pleasing to God. If anything that is not covered there, it's not uh, ultimately that important. Uh, and so that doesn't count the things that are clearly derived from Scripture, the ways we can reason out and all this sort of stuff. But Scripture is sufficient. Uh, it tells us everything we need to know. Sixth, the Bible is powerful. It has the power of God's Spirit working in it. And as we read, we as believers who have God's Spirit living within us can understand the Bible through the power of the Spirit. And Several times, the, the, I think Paul tells us, and, and maybe some others as well, that you can't discern spiritual things if you don't have the Spirit. You can't understand these things if you aren't already uh, indwelt by God himself. And so Scripture is powerful. It's not just a book. It's a, uh, a place where God himself speaks. Um, seventh, the Bible is Christ-centered. Now this goes back to everything we've already been pointing out, but the whole story is about Jesus. It leads to Jesus. It centers on Jesus, and everything is directed to him. He's the goal of the whole thing. And because of all this, because of all these things, really, this, this last one is kind of as a result. The Bible is precious. It's precious. It's, in, it's valuable, like, like a rare gem. We, we should not take for granted the fact that we, uh, and we'll, we'll get to some of this actually tonight, in the whole course of Christian history, we have more access to Bibles than people could ever believe of even 100 years ago. You know, we just, we just, we have Bibles. We talk about, oh, do I want to have uh, an ESV or a CSV or an NIV? Do I want to have one with a genuine leather top or a goat skin top? Do I want to have, we have all these choices and it's really absurd. Uh, and so we have a wealth of riches. We're going to, we're going to talk some more about that, but we should just take God's word and realize that it's precious uh, and realize that even though we have such great access to it, we should still treat it that way. We're not question two. We're going to kind of move in a more apologetic direction here. 
Um, and so th these questions will go by a little bit quicker as we go. Uh, but I want to kind of talk through some of these basic things. And uh, it's, it's something that's a little bit more uh, relevant of a question when we get to the New Testament. Um, uh, the Old Testament, there's, some of these questions are, are still there. But especially when you get to the Gospels, a lot of these questions really come out to the front. And people, even on the news, on every seems every year there's some kind of magazine at Christmas time that goes, oh, well, this, this secret story about Jesus and all this sort of stuff. Um, so the question is phrased like this. I've heard books were left out of the Bible. How can we know which books are right? Right? If we said all those things that we believe about Scripture, that only works if we know what Scripture is, if we know what books count as Scripture. And so how do we know we have the right ones? Well, the canon, and not that kind of canon. Um, the canon with one in in the middle. Uh, it, it's a word that refers to a list of authoritative books. It originally kind of comes from the word for like a reed or a ruler, a stick. Um, it's the kind of measuring line that tells us um, what things are in and out uh, of the canon. And uh, as we've already mentioned, the Old Testament is 39 books. The New Testament is 27. But there's some myths out there about the canon. And these were uh, famously, a lot of these came from the, the Da Vinci Code, which was a book by Dan Brown and then a movie, I think, in 2006. And a lot of these things got really popular. And a lot of people started to internalize a lot of these really terrible myths about the, 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 old, the, the Bible, the New Testament. And so he kind of claimed something like it was invented by the Emperor Constantine in the 4th century. Um, that before that, there were all these books going around, and they just picked the ones that they liked. And he, because he was such a powerful person, could do that. And then the church uh, was still in disagreement about which book should be in or out. And there was just constant battle back and forth for hundreds of years. Uh, and really, that's not true at all. Um, so what's the truth? How did the canon come together? Well, the Old Testament canon, those 39 books that were finished writing around 400, that was closed up around 400. <laughs> and the Jews agree. You'll see this because the Jews have the same 39 books, uh, maybe organized differently, as we talked about, but uh, the same books that are there. Uh, they don't add other ones. They don't, they're not missing any of those. Um, and so that's really not a question. More of the question comes when we talk about the New Testament. But the New Testament was clearly embraced early. If you look at any of the kind of documents we have from the, the first and second generation church fathers, uh, from, the, from the early second century and such, they quote all these books. Uh, they quote a lot of them, and you can, you can tell that they're quoting it as they realized this was not any other book. And there was a core of books that they knew were from the apostles. They knew these were from, from Paul. They knew this was from Peter. They knew this was from John. And those things were, were, were never in question. There were a couple of books that were smaller, shorter, um, things like Second and Third John, which were sent to specific churches, which didn't quite get universally accepted immediately. But let's think about why that might have happened. Well, they were small and sent to other churches. Everybody was like, "Well, uh, I don't know about this one," because they weren't familiar with it. But anyway, uh, the core of the New Testament was never in doubt. There were a couple of books that they had question marks about, but then they worked through those questions together as the church collective uh, in you know, around the fourth century, and they figured it out. <laughs> and they uh, established that. So what, how did they decide what was in the canon? Well, one of the things to, to recognize um, is that the canon is recognized, specifically, not created. The church didn't make the canon. The, the church didn't create the Bible. The Bible created the church. And so what do they recognize in these books, these letters, uh, that made them special, that made them different, that made all these things in the light? Well, one of them would be the divine qualities that you see. You see that there's truth, there's power, there's unity in these books. You can tell that God is speaking to you from this book. Um, that tells you on its own uh, that this book is authoritative and speaks into your life. Uh, but there are other factors as well. Uh, one of them is widespread recognition and acceptance. So all the different churches, um, as these letters were written, they would have been passed around and copied. Each church would have made their own copy. These things would have been used and used up um, as people studied them uh, with great uh, enthusiasm. And so everybody knew about these letters. You're like, oh, yeah, have you guys gotten the one that Paul sent to Thessalonians? You know, oh, yeah, we got that one. We've got the one from uh, Philippi over here. You know, so, and they would pass these things along. You can even see some references to that uh, in the New Testament itself. There's a, a letter that Paul sent to the Laodiceans, and he tells uh, one of the churches, hey, y'all read that letter too. We don't have that letter. but um, So they were sending these letters all around. Um, but there were a certain set of them that they knew uh, and that they recognized as a universal church. And like we said, around uh, 300 and so, they, uh, they came together and they agreed. Hey, these are the books we all recognize. And how did they know, again, that they were written by the apostles? 
by authoritative agents, men who were licensed not to kill, but to speak for God. And so uh, they knew these books were from the apostles. And so, um, you know, uh, or here, here's how this works, right? If you th start going through, okay, Matthew, that was great. What about Mark? Well, wait a minute. Mark's not one of the disciples. How did, how does he know? Well, we believe Mark was there a long time. And our tradition tells us that Mark r records the, the, the memoirs, if you will, of Peter. And that uh, we, from earlier on, everybody agrees with that. Okay. And if you go to Luke, Luke wasn't one of the apostles, okay, but Luke was one of Paul's best friends and traveled all around with him. And so you kind of have that connection between Mark and Peter. And then everything else uh, is written by Paul or John or Peter or these, uh, these guys, James and Jude, who are actually the brothers of Jesus. Um, again, if, <laughs> I'm sort of rambling, but if you can get your brothers to believe that you are the son of God, <laughs> that says something. <laughs> so uh, that's again they were leaders in the early church and it's another uh, sign that uh, something truly unique had happened with Jesus uh, but what about some other books what about the Apocrypha so you may have heard of the Apocrypha you may oh what in the world is that um, well there basically there are around 14 books um, and these come from those silent years kind of more specifically 300 to 100 BC and they come in between the Old Testament and the New Testament these are books like 1st and 2nd Maccabees, books like Tobit, Judith, uh, some of these stories that, that come from this time period. And uh, they, they, they record a lot of Jewish history, um, especially Maccabees. It, it's all kind of history that takes you right through it. Um, and as they recorded these things, they wrote them down. They created this, this literature. Um, but there was an awareness, even in these books, that what they were writing wasn't Scripture, that it was somehow different than the Old Testament books that had been uh, handed down from the prophets. They knew that there was there was no prophet on the scene who could have given them a new word from God. And so uh, these books uh, are there. And so how, why do we even still talk about them? Well, it's because there's some disagreements amongst the different kind of branches of Christianity, if you will. The Catholic churches, and the Orthodox churches um, will accept these books, uh, not as necessarily on the same exact level of scripture, but as the second tier, uh, as the deuterocanonical books, all right? We've talked about what a canon is. Deutero is just the word for second. So it's kind of the second canon. And so uh, if you get a, a Catholic Bible, you'll see that there's going to be a section of, with the Apocrypha and that sort of stuff. And, you know, what's in these books? Nothing super crazy, right? It's history, uh, some, some wisdom literature, some, some romance stories uh, and whatnot. Susanna, uh, and all these sort of books. They're, they're, they're not bad. Uh, there's a couple odd doctrines in there in a couple different verses, but mostly they're, they're perfectly fine, but they're not inspired, right? They're still great to read. Uh, if, you've, if you ever uh, get a chance to, there's nothing wrong with reading them, uh, but they're just there. We don't, we don't accept them as scripture, but we can still find them helpful to study and read, all right? And so just to keep that in your head, when somebody talks about the Apocrypha, oh man, it's not this mysterious hidden book. It's just the books that came in between, the history and the stuff that they wrote during those years. Um, but then, that's the Old Testament sort of apocrypha, and there were some other things, but what about these so-called hidden gospels? And these are the things that make the headlines all the time. This is what the Dan Brown Da Vinci Code was all about. What about these hidden gospels, the Gospel of Thomas? Well, several of these writings uh, were discovered even somewhat recently that claim to be other gospels. So we have the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, but what about the Gospels of Thomas, Peter, Philip, these other guys? Well, Somebody wrote them and put that title on them. But was it written by those apostles? No, 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 no. These books arrived later, clearly later, um, second century or even third century. We know they were never as popular. We don't have very many copies of them. And they're clearly not original. And uh, I kind of want to show you this just to give you some confidence in the Gospels we do have and the church has recognized. So do we have the right books? Well, yes. How do we know that our books are, are better than these? Well, these books are, are often called, instead of the Apocrypha, they're called the Pseudepigrapha. Again, you just love to throw some Greek words in there and make it sound like it's more complicated. It's the books with the false name. Books that claim to be from somebody, that claim to be from biblical characters, but they're not. So you, you'll, uh, if you ever look up the Pseudepigrapha, or there's some Old Testament stuff, there's some New Testament sort of stuff that basically, and uh, it's, it's, I don't know if you all are familiar with this concept, but it's basically fan fiction. Uh, that's written in the biblical universe. 
uh, these sort of spin-offs that people would do, and they'd write, say, oh, I'm going to write this story and claim it came from Naphtali, I'm, or I'm going to give you this. And uh, so they, they wrote a bunch of these things. And then later on, they also wrote some extra Gospels about Jesus. But they're often full of some wacky stuff. I think in the, the Gospel of Thomas, there's a story about boy Jesus, right? We, we didn't hear much about Jesus as a boy, but where Jesus is playing with a friend, and a friend falls off the roof and hits his head and is, is killed, and everybody's like, oh, no, and they sort of blame Jesus. And Jesus jumps down and goes and raises the boy and says, oh, no, it, did, yeah, it, it sounds a little different, right? And there's lots of other things. Uh, they are often very uh, derogatory of women. There's lots of things that get wacky and weird in these so-called hidden Gospels. So we know that they're not on the same level as Scripture. These are things that came later, and they're crazy. So we can be confident that we have the right books, the ones we have. Any questions on, on that kind of topic? I know I was blazing through some of those things. I just want to kind of get that in your head. We're going to be talking about, you know, the, the Gospels a lot here in the first few weeks of this class. And so I uh, just wanted to talk a little bit about canon. Yeah. I heard something about um, the, the letters are arranged from the largest to the smallest. Yeah, uh, Paul's letters are, yes. Oh, so okay. Romans is 16 chapters, Corinthians is 16 chapters, and it's sort of by word, you know, keep going down, 2 Corinthians is also kind of big, and keep going down, all the way down, like Philemon, which is tiny. Uh, and there's actually a division between the letters he sent to churches and the letters he sent to individuals. So 1st, 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, those are sent to people. But the rest of them are sent to cities, churches in the cities. But yeah, that's how they're organized. They're not in chronological, they're just which one's the biggest to the smallest. And that's that's where we get our order. But yeah, so yeah. Did we, did we get rid of the apocrypha had with the Reformation with Martin Luther? Like yes, that's that's part of the story. Um, so one thing to note is that Jews don't call the apocrypha scripture. The Jews have have, have never done that, even though it's Jewish literature, uh, pre Christianity. Um, but there are, uh, like I said, a couple of there's a couple wacky doctrines in there. Uh, some of them that are like the praying for the dead and indulgences and some things like that. Uh, the, the doctrine of purgatory, these sort of things that are hinted at. They're not even explicitly affirmed, but they're hinted in these books. And so the Catholic Church was motivated to accept these books and have them kind of officially recognized um, in order to preserve these. Uh, specific kind of odd doctrines they had. Um, but yeah, that, that was, it really came to a head. It really wasn't much of an issue until after the Reformation. And so people, people would reference these works all the time. You know, even people like Luther and Calvin, you know, uh, re reference them in places and they're not like against them, but then the Catholic Church, after the Reformation, uh, to, just to give you the details, the, the Council of Trent, this whole counter-Reformation, it happened afterwards when, uh, after the Protestants broke away, the Roman Catholics went down and doubled down on a bunch of stuff. And uh, that's where they officially made the Apocrypha part of Scripture. Uh, they, they wouldn't say it like that, but that's, that's, that's kind of what happened. And so from that point on, there's been this division between the Catholics and the Protestants. Now, some of the Orthodox groups have had this stuff recognized for a long time. The Ethiopian Orthodox Church has even extra ones. Uh, but they're, they're kind of just there. You know, there's nothing really super, super crazy in them. Uh, they're just d different books that uh, some have treated differently. And so, yeah. Where did the Catholics get the notion that Mary was the one to pray to and not Jesus? Well, that, that'd probably be a long story, and I'm, I'm not sure I have the, the best answer for that, but that's kind of a... Um, I, I have to get back to you on that one. I, I don't know how. To, I don't know where they get it. That's kind of that's kind of what I would say is I, I don't really know. Uh, ultimately, uh, there's there's a there's a, there's a lot of strange things that have happened in the doctrine of Mary that just kind of uh, you know like the that Mary herself was conceived immaculately, the immaculate conception. That Mary had no sin. That. You know, there's the, the perpetual virginity of Mary. Some of these things are there, and that just, I don't know how it makes sense with Scripture. It's kind of a tradition built upon it, and built upon it, built upon it, and then they tried to squeeze it back in. Um, so I'd say something like that, but I can, I can work on that and give you a better answer. Uh, 
Yeah, no, for sure. Y'all can. This is what the youth series was all about. Ask me questions. Give me homework. Um, so if you have if you have a question, you have a specific thing. I'd love to to, to do a little research and, and give you some some background on some of those things. So I'll take a look, and we can talk about that one. I think. Is there any other question before we do a little bit more? We got five more minutes. Yeah. Josephus, what is that? Josephus was a Jewish writer from right around the time of Jesus, maybe a little bit after, who gave us the history of all the stuff that happened around that time. So right after Jesus is around 30 AD, the 70 AD, what, what big thing happened? The temple was destroyed. The Rome came in and destroyed a bunch of Jerusalem. There's a lot of violent wars. There was a there was a there was a rebellion a little bit before that from the Jewish people. And Josephus is one of the guys who recorded all that history. And so he left a lot of stuff that people were able to find. And he talks about Christianity and talks about some of the things and says, yeah, they were claiming that this guy raised from the dead. And so they, he tells us a little bit about what Christians believed, and it's another kind of witness to the fact of what was going on back in the first century. Yeah. All right. Well, we're going to try to get through this one. <laughs> we'll see. Uh, uh, we've got a couple minutes. I won't, I won't keep you long because we're going to obviously not make it through all these. So we'll, we'll come back and do maybe part two of this next week. Um, but another question that people might ask is, has the Bible been hopelessly corrupted? This is another thing that happens when you kind of bring up these oh, the hidden gospels and stuff. Well, the short answer is no. No, it hasn't. You may hear this from people. People may think, well, isn't the Bible just you know, a copy of copies of copies of translations of translations of translations and all that sort of stuff? How many of you have heard people say something like that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's something a lot of people will say. And here's the truth, folks. It's just ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense uh, if you know any of what's going on. So when, when we look at the originals of the scriptures, do we have the original documents? No. No, we don't. We don't. And why not? Because they were passed around from church to church to church. They were used up. They probably just disintegrated in some church's uh, storehouse um, in, you know, the third or fourth century, uh, if you had to ask me. Um, but we have very old manuscripts, some even from the second century. Uh, and we have full manuscripts from the fourth century. Um, and so the point is, yeah, from the 300s, we have whole complete copies of the New Testament. So we can go very far back to check things. We're not translating a translation. We go back and study, and that's what people go to seminary to do. They go, to, they learn the Greek, they learn the Hebrew, they go back and study these things and, and work with them, and we can see, yep, that person made that up, <laughs> or no, that, that translation got that wrong. We're not translating from English versions. We're, we go back to the original, and every every kind of good Bible translation that you would look at, um, that is a translation and not a paraphrase, will we'll do that. Um, We'll talk about translations a little bit later on. But here's, here's some of those copies, some of the really most important ones. Codex Vaticanus, which again, Latin makes it sound smart, even though it just means the book from the Vatican. And then the book from the Sinai Desert, Codex Sinaiticus. These were copies that they, they found uh, within the last 200 years, um, but they can date them to the 4th century, and they're whole, complete copies of the New Testament. You know, so it, we can tell you, at least then, it was already set in stone. And so this idea that over the, the centuries of the medieval ages, people were constantly tweaking and meddling with Scripture, that's just not true. Um, but here's a, here's a kind of medium answer. So are there uh, variations in the text? Well, yes. The Bible has been passed down with some minor differences in the manuscripts throughout the centuries, but none of these differences affect anything important. None of them affect any important teachings. Um, and, you know, we might think, well, why didn't God just kind of make like one golden glowing copy of the Bible and just keep it perfectly preserved throughout the years? He didn't do that. And if you think about what would have to take place for that, if there was like some kind of supernatural law that you couldn't copy the Bible incorrectly, every elementary student copying out a Bible verse would have to be like bound to spell everything correctly and well, not so right. When, when humans copy things, we, we introduce differences. And uh, so in the manuscripts, we can see these differences and there are Differences that we see, um, but we know about them. And so I'll tell you a little bit about some of these. Uh, we're running out of time here, uh, but so if, you, if you're somebody that has to go, you're always welcome to pop on out for choir. Uh, we'll just try to get through some of this, but 
Printing press was invented in 1444, right? That gives us 1,400 of years to transfer stuff before you had the printing press. So that means everything else was handwritten. That's what manuscript means, hand write. Uh, and so that's what these things are. And you may hear from, from the same people that want to scare you with the hidden gospels, are there really over 500,000 variants in the New Testament? Yes, there are. But take that in context. Right? Why are there so many variants? Because... Largely, we have so many manuscripts. We have over five, 500, you know, 5,500 manuscripts. Some of them even say more than that. Um, and that's a whole lot of manuscripts, folks. Uh, so you've got to imagine, even if there's you know, so many variants per one, uh, and each of them is being counted individually. Uh, and most of them, a lot of these variants don't change anything at all. They're, they're things like word order, uh, using a synonym or spelling a word differently. Uh, things that you would naturally do if you were copying something out. And a lot of times, that's what happens. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all very similar. A lot of times, what happens is somebody is going along with Matthew, and he remembers the verse the way Luke worded it, and he puts Luke's wording in. That happens several times where we can see that. And then the next guy came and didn't know he'd done that and copied that. But again, that we're talking about these things means we're aware of them. Here's just a comparison of the New Testament to some other classic works. So you can see that the New Testament is in... Uh, the, the middle there, that's the original Greek. Then the big pink circle, I think it's pink, is uh, all the translations of the New Testament that we have. And some of these other things, like the, the, the next biggest circle we have is Homer. Uh, and then people like Caesar and all, this, all these sort of writings about these folks and by these folks, a whole lot less copies. Not, you know, not just two or three. There's, there's hundreds of a couple of these, but right, you can see that the New Testament's on a completely different scale. We have tons and tons of manuscripts, which means we can very easily, not well, I shouldn't say very easily, but we can be confident that we haven't lost anything, that we haven't messed it up. We, can, we have a lot of things to cross-check against each other. And the, the truth is that we're not really missing anything. It's that a lot of them have extra words. That's what a lot of these variants are, right? They're, people are much more likely to add when they're copying a piece of scripture than they are to take stuff away. A lot less likely to leave things out. And so it's like putting a puzzle piece together, right? Think about this. If you had a puzzle piece, of, you're trying to build a puzzle on your table at home, and you're missing a few pieces, right? When you get to the end, you can't finish it, right? But what if you have extra pieces in there that they accidentally kind of shoved in there? Can you finish the puzzle? Can you complete the puzzle? Yes. That's, that's an analogy I think is pretty good for this, right? It, it might be tricky to fit the puzzle together if you've got some extra pieces. You don't know where they're supposed to go. But it can be done. And there's people that dedicate their lives to that. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you about this, and I'll give you kind of a definition of this specific branch of study. There are a small, level, small number, a small number of these, like maybe 2% of them, that do seem to change the meaning of something. Uh, or they seem to add a big chunk. But we can compare them and figure it out, right? We've got all of these manuscripts. There are some really nerdy guys who will go in there and study all this and uh, look it up and study it, and people will, will do it. It's called textual criticism. I give you kind of a, a definition in there. So it's the study of ancient manuscripts that seeks to sort out and analyze all the variations found in the later copies and try to go back and establish what the original text was. So there's people that do that. And there's a, there's a website that has a, a lot of good stuff on the things we're talking about today, the, the kind of the canon, the textual variants, all that sort of stuff. It's called, very creatively, textandcanon.org. Um, it's put together by the folks at Phoenix Seminary Really good stuff on there. That I've seen. It's a fairly new site. So uh, if you're interested in this kind of stuff, check out that website. Um, uh, and the, just to give you a heads up, there are two chunks, and we're going to talk about these relatively soon, that we, we see seem to be later editions. And these are the ending of Mark mm -hmm. and the story of the, the woman caught in adultery, which is in John. These are the only time that there's something larger than a couple words or even just a, a phrase or a verse that uh, there's, there's a variant that's that big. These are the, the only two. We know about them. And guess what? If you look in, in any Bible you have, they'll tell you about it. Mm -hmm. And I just look in, looked in the Bible that I had and put the pictures up, right? The earliest manuscripts do not include 753 through 8 through 11. Or you can see on the other one, some of the earliest manuscripts end at verse 8. So you can tell you, every modern Bible you have... Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe if you can find one that doesn't, maybe show it to me, but most of them will tell you these things, right? 
Uh, I think I mentioned sometimes, you've got to pay attention to those footnotes. So you'll see. In the footnotes of your Bible, if you start paying attention to these, they'll say things like, other MSS, meaning manuscripts, say this word. And so where there are textual variants, the ones that are big and different, they're probably already in your footnotes. There's not any like hidden things out there like, oh man, there's this thing we're going to find out that all of a sudden this is all totally changed. Or It's not like the variant says, oh, and Jesus didn't get raised from the dead. Like, no, these are not the kind of variants that are there. The, the core doctrines of the church are completely without question. There's a couple passages where there's a big question, but right, does it make a huge difference if we don't have these stories? Well, maybe a little bit, but it's not that big a deal. And these are the two that we, we know are weird. Uh, how do we know they're weird? Well, partially because the manuscripts do all sorts of different things with them. Sometimes this story shows up in chapter 7. Sometimes it shows up in chapter 6. Sometimes it shows up in Luke. Uh, so they know this is probably added later. Uh, we can talk more about that. You can study those things if you want. Here's, here's the bottom line. Point is we know about it. We can study it. Don't let anybody scare you. We can have confidence that God's word has been preserved faithfully. All right, folks. Uh, that's where we're going to end today. We went a few minutes over, and I blame the clock because it died. So I, st I still have five minutes. I perpetually got five more minutes. Um, but thank you guys for coming. Uh, if you have any questions afterward, let me know. We're going to close with prayer just real quick. And then some of y'all got to scurry off to choir. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you that uh, you have preserved it in a way that we can be fully confident that we know what you would have us to do. Lord, uh, we pray that as we study the New Testament and look at some of these issues, Lord, that you would um, build our faith through it, that we wouldn't just learn it as something that's kind of an academic discipline, something just to be curious about, but Lord, something that would transform our hearts so that we might live for you and grow more and more in the likeness of your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. Yes. And next time we'll talk about Bible translations. All the spicy drama with Bible translations.